Hey everyone, it's Jalian. Democratic Representative Cori Bush made history when she became the first Black Congresswoman for Missouri, unseating the Clay political dynasty. She brought her background as a nurse, activist, organizer, single mom, and pastor to her new role and has jumped headfirst into advocating for issues ranging from reparations for Black Americans to taxing billionaires to Medicare for all. She teamed up with Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey and Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth to introduce a bill that would bring together federal agencies and create a mapping tool to help allocate environmental funding from the Biden administration. Just last week, she also joined forces with New York Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to introduce a $1 trillion bill to fund environmental justice projects for the next four years. The urgency of this climate crisis and environment, uh, environmental racism, it demands that we equip our, our cities and our local governments with this funding. Um, and so that's what people should be paying attention to. We need to address this climate crisis. This is free money. Every community should use it to fight the crisis and save lives. So if they look at it that way, save lives. So on this episode, we'll hear from Senator Tammy Duckworth and Congresswoman Cori Bush about three major environmental justice bills, the Environmental Justice for All Act, the Environmental Justice Mapping and Data Collection Act, and the Green New Deal for Cities Act. From St. Louis Public Radio and PRX, this is We Live Here. Two years ago on Earth Day, Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth launched the Environmental Justice Caucus in the U.S. Senate. She co-founded the caucus, along with Democratic Senators Cory Booker of New Jersey and Tom Carper of Delaware, because of environmental issues in Illinois that disproportionately affect Black and brown people, such as the Centerville sewage crisis. Anytime it rains, there's raw sewage that actually backs up into people's homes and, and you can see toilet paper in people's front yards, and it's just literally decades of neglect and, and basically based racist policies and investments in infrastructure repairs and uh, infrastructure upgrades. They've now banded together with several other communities within the region that are going to be called the Cahokia Heights uh, community, and I've been working with them to try to help them win some federal grants in order to upgrade the sewer system. They've been talking to our governor to try to get some state funding as well to come in um, and, and to really take some of these decision making out of local policymakers and have it be a really independent review of where do you really need this fix. The Senate's Environmental Justice Caucus brought federal attention to environmental racism, paving the way for legislation such as the Environmental Justice for All Act, which was first introduced by former California Senator Kamala Harris, with Senators Duckworth and Booker as co-sponsors. Now, with Kamala Harris in the White House as the vice president, Senator Duckworth has stepped up to be the lead sponsor of the bill, which she reintroduced in mid-March. One of the things that it does is that it amends and strengthens the Civil Rights Act of 1964 um, that prohibits discrimination based on disparate impacts and overturns a court case. So this is a civil right and that we are infringing on people's civil rights when we allow them to be discriminated based on access to a clean environment. Um, uh, it also builds on existing legislation like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act by explicitly adding language that says that you have to consider cumulative impacts when you make a permit decision. She explains that permitting decisions often result in black and brown communities having to bear the brunt of industrial pollution and environmental injustice. Permit after permit after permit is granted. And cumulatively, they add to a significant environmental pollutants, say, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, toxins in the atmosphere that then results in high rates of childhood asthma. But if you only look at it one permit at a time, it doesn't seem like very much. But for black and brown residents of neighborhoods in the southeast side of Chicago, which have been treated for decades as an industrial dumping ground, even one permit can be too much. General Iron, a scrap metal shredding company, was once located in Lincoln Park, a mostly white, middle and upper class neighborhood on the north side of Chicago. It processed over 700,000 tons of metal a year, 
and could emit up to 100 tons of volatile organic compounds a year, which are associated with cancer, birth defects, and other health problems. For years, Lincoln Park residents filed complaints about fluff, or dust, that would coat their sidewalks, roads, porches, and playgrounds. But during the pandemic, they demanded that General Iron close their doors and leave. And in January, General Iron closed and left the north side. Then, Reserve Management Group bought General Iron, rebranded it as South Side Recycling, and sought to move the metal shredding operation to the southeast side of Chicago, within walking distance of a local park, high school, and elementary school. The white neighborhood said, hey, we don't want this, we don't want you to be, um, you know, doing this work here. Um, and so they denied the permit there, but then they requested a permit in this largely Latino, uh, Latinx and, and Black community. But because the permit, there's not this rule that says you have to look at the cumulative effects, they only look at the one permit, um, uh, forgetting that we've actually had an auto um, metals reclamation uh, a yard there that has been putting manganese into the air, that this area has been exposed to pet coke, uh, that this area has been, um, has actually some brown fields and this area, you know, nobody looked at the cumulative effects. Black and brown community activists in the lower income, mostly Latino neighborhood point out that if the metal scrapping company is too harmful for white affluent residents of the north side, it's also too dangerous for the black and brown lower income residents of the southeast side. They organize protests, marches, and teach-ins to raise awareness about the plans to move the metal scrapping facility. In February, they went on a month-long hunger strike to demand that Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot deny an operating permit to the facility. Mayor Lightfoot failed to meet their demand, but there is now a federal investigation to investigate Chicago's zoning and land use practices, triggered by a complaint from Southeast Side residents to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. When we talk about Black Lives Matter, we talk about uh, uh, civil rights and, and, and structural racism in our society, especially after last summer, people think of it in terms of the criminal justice system, but they don't recognize that it exists just within the very structure of things like um, uh, building code permits and, and, and the like. Uh, that it is the it is the black and brown communities that have been the places where we have put our most polluting industries. Senator Duckworth explains that federal legislation to address permitting and enforcement is important because black and brown residents are at a disadvantage when it comes to time and resources to fight back against polluting industrial companies. We have. Um, a, a plant that actually cleans medical devices and it uses gas, ethylene oxide. Um, there is a plant uh, in a, a community called Burr Ridge. This is a very wealthy, affluent, white, largely white neighborhood. Um, and then they were also in um, a Waukegan, Illinois, which is a largely Latinx community. The white community were able to band together activists. Uh, they had the spare time, the resources, and they were able to demand and get EPA monitoring of the air there. But the EPA never put an air monitor in the, in the Latinx community, even though those folks were asking for it as well, um, because the EPA had more focus on the white community than they did the, the, the brown community. And that while Keegan actually, the city was actually contemplating taking out a loan so that it could pay for its own um, air monitoring to protect its own residents. That's structural racism. That's a classic example, and we need to stop that. That's why the Environmental Justice for All Act would create a working group where federal agencies can coordinate their efforts on health equity, environmental justice, enforcement of environmental laws, and more. It codifies the Clinton administration's environmental justice executive order by creating a working group to ensure compliance and enforcement and to develop a government-wide strategy so that it's not just something that the EPA worries about, that, but in fact, the Department of Defense should worry about environmental justice as well. Um, so should the Department of Commerce, so should the Small Business Administration. It should be a whole-of-government approach to environmental justice. This perspective reflects the sweeping nature of the bill, which also provides funding to study potentially harmful products marketed toward women and girls of color, research environmental and public health issues, and assist communities and workers in a transition away from fossil fuel economies. For Senator Duckworth, 
the bill's effort to ensure equitable access to outdoor spaces and recreation hits home. As a wheelchair user, I have a hard time accessing outdoor spaces, especially national parks and the like. And the national parks are currently going through a process of making them all wheelchair accessible. They have not all been that way. In Chicago, there was a study that came out um, about 18 months ago that said that Chicago, with a wonderful lakeshore, on average has one day a year when the lakeshore beaches would be shut down um, due to uh, poor water quality. Um, and, and so if you're up north uh, near the Magnificent Mile or some of the wealthier suburbs up north, you may have one day a year when that, lake sh- when that beach might be shut down. But if you're on the south side of Chicago, which is a largely black community, um, they have an average of 39 days a year where that, lake sh- where that beach is shut down. That's not fair. And even though much of the environmental legislation that Senator Duckworth is proposing aims to mitigate current harms, she's also working toward a better environment for her daughters. I have a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old daughter. I want them to have a better environment than the one that I grew up in in the 70s and 80s and the one that we're living in right now. I want a carbon neutral future before they become adults. Um, you know, I, I, I want us to get to a place where the environment is something that they can enjoy and and. And, you know, I hope that they will read about environmental pollutions and and all of that in history books. Um, And and, and I want it to be available to all because I want my daughters to experience it, but I also want, you know, their friends to have it no matter where they live in this country as well. Senators Tammy Duckworth and Ed Markey have teamed up with Congresswoman Cori Bush to introduce another major piece of environmental legislation. So up next, We'll hear from Congresswoman Cori Bush about the Environmental Justice Mapping and Data Collection Act, the Green New Deal for Cities Act, and why St. Louis should be at the forefront of the fight for environmental justice. When Cori Bush became the first Black Congresswoman for Missouri, she said that her win was about the everyday person from St. Louis. My promise to St. Louis was that I would do the absolute most for each and every person, starting with those who have the very least, and that this this work would be bold transformational change that we would be um, working towards. So every single thing that we do, we look at it from the lens of what St. Louis needs. That's why her team jumped at the chance to partner with Senators Ed Markey and Tammy Duckworth on the Environmental Justice Mapping and Data Collection Act of 2021. The bill would create a tool to help direct 40 percent of Biden administration environmental related funds toward communities most impacted by environmental racism. This is something that has to happen to make sure that our communities that are oftentimes the ones that are overlooked or um, left out, left behind, when we talk about um, what is needed to better our environment, what is needed to help. And then also when we talk about the climate crisis period and who's most directly affected, but then who are the ones that are um, behind all of it, you know, making sure our communities get what we need. This is the step, being able to have this committee, you know, to establish this committee where there are representatives from the EPA and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and um, and so many other groups to be able to have that, to be able to make sure that we are touching every area of our community um, is, uh, you know, this is just a great thing for us. The Environmental Justice Mapping Committee would bring together representatives from various federal agencies and departments to establish a tool that maps environmental justice communities across the country based on the added impacts of indicators such as demographics, public health, pollution burdens, and proximity to hazardous waste facilities and fossil fuel infrastructure. The committee would also direct federal agencies and departments to conduct audits to identify data that relate to environmental justice concerns, including killings of individuals by law enforcement officers. It leads so many people across St. Louis to live in a lethal environment. You know, we live in an environment where we have to wonder not only if I walk out of my home, you know, could I be um shot and killed by police, but also in my own home, you know, could something happen while I, while, while I'm sleeping in my bed, you know, so this, 
it, we're talking about what affects your environment, the environment around you. So that includes gun, uh, gun violence, communal violence. It affects any, we're talking about anything that is going to, um, that's in our environment that changes um, or affects our way of life. And so police violence has to be a part of that. And for us, it was, um, it was uh, important to get this in, in this bill, because St. Louis is and has been for so long, number one for police murder in the country per capita, um, and then also fluctuating number one and number two, you know, oftentimes per capita for, um, for homicides. Uh, so th it, this was something that our community needed. Representative Bush adds that St. Louis needs funding to address environmental justice issues. She's optimistic about the return of earmarks, which allow funds to be targeted towards specific projects within spending and infrastructure bills. Earmarks have been banned in the legislative branch over the last decade over concerns about corruption and transparency. But now, Democrats and Republicans have brought them back with new requirements. Lawmakers have to make requests for earmarks public, and they can only make 10 requests, which can't benefit their immediate family members. Overall, earmarks can't surpass 1% of annual discretionary spending, but that still comes out to over $10 billion. To secure even more funding for environmental justice initiatives, last week, Representative Bush and New York Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez announced the introduction of the $1 trillion Green New Deal for Cities Act of 2021. The Green New Deal for Cities um, is some is a way for us to make sure that all the things that we're asking for. And one part of that, I have to say, um, is the part where we're saying that we um, want to make sure that the money that is being used, that those resources um, that will be coming to our communities, our cities, our counties, our, um, our states, our territories, our tribes, that that money is going to be used in the areas that are not uh, where money is not going to be funneled to law enforcement, any type of law enforcement, that that money and that 50% of those investments are going to go directly to those frontline communities who need it most. The bill defines frontline communities as predominantly communities of color, low income, deindustrialized, fossil fuel, or tribal and indigenous communities that experience or are at risk of experiencing greater impacts of climate change, environmental effects, or health problems. Representative Bush believes that such significant investment is necessary to fund projects that save lives by remediating lead and mold, developing infrastructure for clean drinking water, air quality monitoring, and flood prevention, and creating hundreds of well-paying jobs for American citizens and indigenous people. The other 50% of the funding is designated for climate mitigation, policies or activities that aim to reduce the impact of greenhouse gases on the climate. But Representative Bush and her colleagues might face significant challenges in passing such major legislation. I'm all for a totally eliminating um, the filibuster. I know that there's talk back and forth um, about uh, making sure that, you know, we get some type of reform. Um, and I do agree that we, we need something to happen um, right away. So the talking filibuster, um, you know, I know that it is on the table, but when we're talking about from workers' rights to reform, we have a mandate to deliver on this bold agenda that we promised. And um, so, uh, you know, looking at this pandemic, people looking at the pandemic, looking at the economic pain and looking at how many people are hurting right now. This is our chance to make good on our voting rights, make good on voting rights, make good on climate justice, um, worker protections, gun violence prevention, like policing. You know, we have to make a meaningful impact on the lives of everyday people. And I don't believe that we can do that by trying to cut up the filibuster to say, we can keep it here, we can keep this part, we can move, remove this part. We need to make sure that the American people know that Congress is fighting for them. And the only way to fight for them to make sure that our LGBTQ community, that that those those rights are protected to make sure that we get the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act, get, that we get that through, that we get the PRO Act through, and that there's so many, so many of uh, so much legislation um, that's going to affect regular everyday people is on the table. Um, and so right now I'm pushing to totally eliminate it. Um, you know, this filibuster for you know, making sure people understand this is a this is a relic 
of Jim Crow that's been used to stall racial equity and justice. And it continues to be a tool of obstruction to this day. And so I can't play with let's do a piece and let's not, you know, we're going for all of it right now. In the past, the filibuster has been used to oppose anti-lynching legislation and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This week, Representative Bush and nearly 100 House Democrats called for Senate Democrats to end the filibuster and remove obstacles toward passing legislation on issues ranging from voting rights to workers' rights to immigration reform. As she continues to push for change in Congress, Representative Bush is motivated by her conviction that St. Louis should be at the forefront of the environmental justice movement. I have seen so many amazing uh, environmental justice activists, um, you know, just doing the work, you know, making their voices heard, you know, right now, looking at what has happened with Coldwater Creek, looking at what has happened with um, Westlake Landfill, um, you know, and the work that has happened because our activists locally have pushed, you know, um, that is the work of, the, of those activists, um, because gun violence is what gun violence is right now, you know, looking at where we are, like I said before, number one, number two for homicides all um you know we're always at the top for violent crime at the top of the list we're always um at the top of the list for and we're at the top of the list for the murder of children in this country so because our environment affects affects us this way where we're living in a lethal and toxic environment we should be at the forefront and not only that um you know as a as a black woman in this country, it was imperative for me to stand up and to use my voice. When I say I'm trying to save black lives, I'm working to, in legislating to save black lives and save brown lives and to save trans lives and to save the lives of indigenous folks. I can't do that and not address what's happening in our environment. We have line three that, you know, that is just upriver from us. We have to talk about our environment if we're talking about saving lives. My work is to create a joyous um, environment where um, clean water and clean air is not a thing, where there, where Black children in St. Louis are not 10 times as likely to enter a, a, a ER, you know, um, uh, more than uh, white children. That, that's not, that should not be our, right, our reality, you know, because of asthma, you know, because of lead and because of arsenic, because of methane. That shouldn't be our, that should not be our reality. Um, a, a, a world where, a community where um, we don't worry about gun violence, where we're not worried about whether the police will um, see us as a threat just because just because we exist, you know, that type of a world, a world where we have um, food, we have healthy foods that we are all of our children are able to access one where we don't have community members sleeping out on the street because they don't have a home. Like that's the kind of world that we're trying to build and we're trying to build it in so many ways. So um, uh, whether it's through uh, environmental justice legislation or um, other pieces, this is what we're going to do. And so when we can improve insulation in homes, when we can weatherize homes, you know, to make it better for people as they're, people as they're just living their lives that's what we want to do improving air quality we deserve that like this is this is what we need and even the small things like lead and mold remediation um being able to breathe and being able to have um uh to have a quality of life each person deserves i was told that i wouldn't be accepted when i walked into congress because of you know because i um you know i won the seat from an incumbent I was told that I would be shut out and boxed in. People would not talk to me. I would not get on the committees I wanted and all of these things. But when I actually, when I got there, well, even before I got there, the the welcome was amazing. People were like, you know what? It, what happened happened, but you're here now and we need to do the work and work together. So that is the same thing that has happened now. Working with the administration, President Biden, that is our president. And that is the person who holds the pen to be able to bring home what St. Louis needs. I'm only here to make sure that we get as much as we can get. I only care about the people of St. Louis who I love so dearly and people all across this country. And so I'm working with President Biden. And yes, he's doing some things that I'm so glad to see happen. I'm so glad, but there is much work to do and we don't agree on everything and that's okay. That's why I'm here to use my voice and to help make sure that the White House, that his administration knows 
what we need directly. And let me say this, my conversations with the White House have been just that. St. Louis needs this. This is happening in St. Louis. I don't care what we're talking about. I don't care if it has anything to do with, <laughs> with localities in that way or not. They're gonna hear about what St. Louis needs. And I feel like that is my, that's the reason why I'm here. The people voted for me because of that. And I said, I was taking St. Louis with me and I do. And so because I'm no respecter of person, I don't care what your title is. You know, and you, that won't back me down from telling you what St. Louis needs because this is how we win. This show is produced by me, Jalian Yang, and my co-producer, Lauren Brown. Thanks to Eric Schmid, St. Louis Public Radio reporter for the Metro East area of Illinois, for co-interviewing Senator Tammy Duckworth with us. And huge thanks to Jason Rosenbaum, politics correspondent for St. Louis Public Radio and co-host of St. Louis Public Radio's Politically Speaking podcast, for co-interviewing Congresswoman Cori Bush with us and collaborating with us on this episode. You can listen to the Politically Speaking episodes with Senator Duckworth and Congresswoman Bush at stlpr.org or anywhere you get podcasts. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. From St. Louis Public Radio and PRX, this is We Live Here. Support for this podcast comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.